Well, we talked about how learning, and, and really I see teaching as learning because you have to learn about the people that you're teaching because it goes both ways. As being in a relationship, and this is my daughter about 16 years ago, and so I feel better already <laughs> <laughs> being able to look at her. And so, and we do need something to make us feel comfort when we're about to launch on something that's challenging. And I think all the way through, we'll see that there's this tension or this delicate balance between comfort and challenge, and comfort and challenge. And that is perhaps one important reason why learning happens in relationships, because it's only in a relationship with someone you know who knows you that moment to moment you can be calculating whether you're ready for more challenge or you need more comfort. So it's another reason why I have my daughter up here. What is she saying? Well, that's because I tricked you because I put it up there. Um, but um, actually what she's saying is, Mommy, yes, that's right, you got it. This sweater is too big. Can you roll up the sleeves, please? <laughs> And uh, the reason why I put it up there is because a lot of uh, the learning that very young children do, particularly pre-verbal, but after they begin to have words too, is about gestures and facial expressions. And we tend to take that for granted, and yet so much of the learning that we do about people that we are with in order to figure out where we are in the relationship, to know if we can take a risk or can dare to ask for comfort, is not what they say, but what they do with their bodies and with their faces. And I also, the, the last reason is I, I put a word up there in Spanish because, and people complain about it sometimes, and they say, damn it, we're in an English-speaking country, why are you putting Spanish up there on slides? And um, can you believe it? People say that. But I um, persist in doing it anyway because, um, first of all, we, we may, English may not be the, um, the first language of this country for much longer, and we'd better get used to, to it. And uh, second of all, because I think it's important when we think about learning to think about struggling through the way we understand, through our words, through our language, to find our way to one that isn't our mother tongue. And I use that expression, mother tongue, for the full force of what it means. So the, the uh, developmental events that take place in the context of relationships that support learning throughout life, we can think about as touch points, but I, I think I first better explain what a touch point is. How many of you have heard the word before? Don't feel bad if you haven't because um, it's a word that Dr. Brazelton made up. And that's why um, you may also may be confused um, about what it means. So here's a quick summary. And it's been used in so many different ways that it's hard to know anymore. But basically what it means is that, that developmental phenomena are, by definition, developmental crises. It's a specific way of thinking about development, not just for children, but throughout life, that says if we're about to take a leap in development, something's got to give. We have a price to pay. It's going to cost us something. And we will become disorganized and fall apart temporarily while that new ability is coming online. So it's a crisis for the child. And if the child is disorganized and falling apart, what happens to the family? They fall apart, too. So when you think about your roles as institutions of a community contributing to this web of relationships that support family, which sounds very lofty and noble, but kind of abstract, you can take a step back and say, well, what do they need support for? Well, for a lot of things, as you all know, and you know your families better than I do. But one of them that will be fairly universal is support for their child's development because it proceeds by crises. The child falls apart. So as a result, if we understand that typical development 
is this dramatic, intermittently disturbing, destabilizing process, then it translates into a way of thinking and being or doing and saying for all of us who work with families of young children. It changes the way we think about the importance of the relationships and the role of the relationships that we have. And then it, it's become an approach to working in a number of sectors. And I would like to add uh, libraries and um, children's museums up there. We've been working with children's museums recently, too. So um, why do we need touch points? Why do we need this way of thinking about development that adds to the way we think about how we are, what we do and say with families. And the first reason is to reaffirm parents' expertise. It used to be that parents were able to draw upon where they came from, from their heritage, from their ancestry in order to know what you were supposed to do to be a parent. And I don't mean to romanticize that, because I think uh, all over the world, uh, parents have found it quite irritating at times to have their mother-in-law or aunt so-and-so tell them, why aren't you doing it this way or why aren't you doing it that way? But there was, there was a sense that there's this body of knowledge out there, whether you disagree with some of it or not, that you can fall back on that's been tested over centuries that comes from who we are as a people. And to some extent, that's been dismantled by corporate culture, by commercial culture, by the homogenization of culture, and by the so-called childhood experts like me, although I try hard to distance myself from that and certainly don't think of myself as an expert in anything, um, in, undermining, in undermining parents' belief in their own expertise. And you, a lot of you talked about empowering parents. And so what we'll be looking at is, well, where, do, where can parents turn to to reaffirm a sense of their own expertise? And do you know where it turns out to be? To their own child's behavior, to the uniqueness of what their child is telling them with their behavior. That will be their guide. That will be their guide. And then, um, Rehumanizing healthcare, I don't know when the last time you went to the doctor was, but last time I went, um, the uh, clerk at the desk did not make eye contact, and she said to me, social? Not even could I have your social security number, please. She said, social? And um, then she sent me away to sit down and then called me by my last name, and then I went to her room and I got undressed and sat naked underneath this Johnny until some strange person came in and started doing things to my body without asking me permission or telling me what was going to happen. And I'm a doctor, so I knew. But you, you all are familiar with that, even if it's just for routine things. It's really, really uncomfortable. And what has happened in healthcare is that we have lost the healing power of the relationship. <clears throat> and, and in fact, I think that there's been a trend in many of our institutions as we've tried to commoditize and disseminate services to take out the one-to-one -one relationship. But you know what? It doesn't work. And I don't think it works in your work any better. And I think you are all about, as I've learned from you, reclaiming the importance of your one-to-one -one relationships to do your work. And I'm going to skip down to, well, the transforming child care into family care. The point here is that in child care, you can't really take care of children if you don't take care of the parents, too. And I, I would ask you to contemplate that as a principle to incorporate into your work as well. That when you are working with children, when you're providing programming for children, what are you doing for families? Now in our work with the children's museums, as we've gone around and talked to folks in different museums, some of them have said, in essence, well, we have this great activity for kids, but the damn parents just pull back and sit down and watch the kids do it or make us do all the work. And so what we said to them is, that's great. You're giving the parents a break. You're letting them take a deep breath and relax. All of you of children of your own remember those days when your children were young, when that was why you brought them to the museum <laughs> or the library, because you needed a break. 
You just needed to sit down and have someone else worry about your kids for a little while in order to be ready to do that whole complicated parenting thing that we're going to be looking at in detail. So rather than seeing that as a negative, why not turn that into a positive and create resting places for parents and encourage them and and applaud? Someone talked about self-care, health care, mental health, their recognition that they need Good thing they showed up today at the library. They, they, you may have prevented child abuse by giving them that chance just to take a break and collect themselves. Shifting uh, child protective services from child rescuing to family strengthening. Well, you know the history of child protective services in this country was in the late 19th century when they had those things called tenements and ghettos. We don't have those anymore, do we? All of these wealthy white ladies would feel guilty about their wealth, and they'd go off into the the poor ghettos and look at all of these immigrant families and um, feel sorry for the kids and take them away from the parents, thinking that they could uh, give them a better life. And uh, in fact, up until the 1970s, uh, many Native American infants and children were removed from their families by Christian missionaries who had this belief that that was the best thing that they could do for them, was to kidnap them and put them into boarding schools where they would be um, punished by having their mouths washed out with soap if they spoke their native language. And then you wonder why when they grew up to be parents, they didn't have a sense of their own capacity to be parented because they never experienced it themselves. So we need to shift social services from rescuing the children from those nasty, awful parents to strengthening families. And I really do believe that in the work that you do, this is a critical role that you can play. Now, I think some of you touched on this when you talked about some of the gifts that families bring you, which is that When we work in an agency or an institution, we get up every day and get ready for work, and we have our conversations with our colleagues. There's just kind of a, you know, life of its own that it takes on, and we just kind of get into the drill, and little by little, we are at risk of losing touch with why we went into it for the first place, with where our passion is that you said families give back to you, and what it is that they bring in the way of strengths that we can build on and support and contribute to, and what it is that they're looking for that we can respond to. So we're looking for a way of resynchronizing our professional cultures, whether it's the professional culture of medicine or the professional culture of children's museums or of libraries, with the cultures of the communities that they serve. And you, I, many of you spoke specifically to the gift that families give you of rededicating you to your mission. And in essence, the way that we do this is just by being quiet and listening and watching the child's behavior and having the child's behavior be our guide. So here are some of the key elements of touch points, and I'm not going to go through all of them today. but I think you'll hear these echoed in the rest of what we will talk about. Uh, I did want to just focus on the developmental aspect. We talked about it as a crisis, remember? A nonlinear, discontinuous process of ups and downs in every child's development rather than something that just chugs along that leads to crises for families. And that the developmental crisis is why families need support from each other, from their communities, and from you as members of their communities. Now, for those of you who've studied human development, you may have been wondering, after all of these years of having memorized Erickson or Piaget or Freud or whoever it was you had to memorize, well, how come one phase stops? Where did it go when it ended? And what is it that sets another one off? Well, it it turns out that one thing we can count on to do that is the development of the brain. So 
So we'll just digress briefly to look at how the brain develops. You all know the neuron is the building block of the brain, and at birth there are probably about 100 billion of them, which is a lot of brain cells, which means that there's a lot going on before the baby is even born, and that there are 50 trillion synapses or connections between the brain cells. Now, why are the synapses important? Well, it's sort of like the way you all started eventually passing the microphone to each other. You kind of got connected to each other and you knew who was next and where things were. And synapses are about sending electrical signals that communicate from one brain cell to another. So at birth, there are 50 trillion, which is an unimaginably large number. But by 12 months of age, that number increases to 1,000 trillion connections between brain cells. And most of that increase in the number of connections between brain cells is because those brain cells have been stimulated by experience to fire off electrical signals that build the connections at one year of age. So when we, we heard about the youngest uh, child being one week old in a library that you were touring, we know that certainly uh, children that young do belong there. And then at 20 years, you see the number drops down to 500 trillion, and people worry that that's because they've been drinking and smoking too much. Um, but, and that may be, but it's, it, and, and people also worry that it's because of lack of use, that they atrophy, and, and there's a possibility that there's some of that. But it's probably also a kind of streamlining, a kind of selective choosing of the connections that are most efficient. And this is just to give you a a sense of what it looks like. You can see at birth, these lonely little neurons are reaching out for each other, trying to connect and send signals. And then by 15 months of age, they found each other. And then by two years of age, there's already this incredibly dense, intricate roadmap. And you may want to think about this, this in remarkable architecture of uh, brain development as being, in part, what each one of you is contributing to for every child under the age of two or three who comes uh, in your library. Now, this is the most complicated slide I'm going to show. So after this, it's really a piece of cake. Uh, and, and I show it to you because it's a way of really connecting brain development to what I said about how the child and the family experiences development as intermittently disorganizing and destabilizing. So you can see on the left, the first peak here, the dotted line, is uh, the increase in the number of connections between brain cells that occurs at roughly two or three months of age. So that sudden peak occurs in only one part of the brain, or a few parts of the brain, not the whole brain. And it corresponds to where the most stimulation and activity is going on at two or three months. It's in the parts of the brain responsible for seeing and hearing and beginning to tag what is being seen and hear, heard with meaning. Because that's really what's going on after birth is all of this environmental, auditory, visual, sensory input. And then at nine months of age, the activity shifts. And there are suddenly a burst in the number of connections between brain cells, completely different parts of the brain, the parts of the brain responsible for receptive and expressive language, because guess what's going to happen pretty soon? I'm going to start to speak, and they're already clearly understanding. And then the next burst represents another shift to other locations in the brain where the brain cells are signaling, signaling like wild to get connected to each other, and this time, it's in the part of the brain that's responsible for uh, other higher level cognitive functions. There's another spurt right before adolescence, which is probably a good thing. Um, so uh, this is an old slide. I think it's probably getting worse everywhere, except perhaps in California. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, just to show that the rate of brain growth, which is represented in this rapidly rising curve on the left-hand side of the slide, where you, you get all this brain growth in the first three years and to some extent in the first six, and we don't start investing publicly in children's education until age five. We just begin then. So 
you know, um, wherever there is parental anxiety, there's somebody ready to exploit it, right? And um, what has happened here is that we have misunderstood how children learned. And that's why I put you through that question of remembering something important that you learned and what it took, what the critical elements were for you to learn. Where I think you all saw many of them were internal feeling states and interpersonal interactions. And yet, what we're being sold to help young children learn is stuff like this. Stuff like this. I actually had this hanging over my children's cribs when they were young a long, long time ago. I'm just glad it didn't fall on them and strangle them. <laughs> you might get sucked into buying these checkerboard crib bumpers. You can never get that out. And if you begin to feel like there's something missing, you could always go with a plastic human face, right? And if, you, if you're really anxious and you really want to get an early start, there's always the Pregnina phone, right? <laughs> and of course, you all know that in the, the last trimester, the auditory apparatus is really set up to go. And if you read the same, so you might think about this for programming, actually. <laughs> Expectant mothers, yes, we've got it. They don't need to use the Pregnina phone. And it'd be great to have the fathers, too. And I'll come back to fathers in involving them in, in a moment. But if you read the same nursery rhyme over and over and over again, they'll probably be so sick of it, they'll never read it after that child's born. The child will recognize it and distinguish it from other nursery rhymes at birth. Incredible. And they, they recognize their father's voices, too. Anybody, any, any man who's had a baby will know that the first time they opened their mouth, if they were present during the last few months, the baby opens their eyes and looks right at them in the first minutes of life. So I guess my question is, what are we trying to accomplish after all? And with all of this emphasis on literacy, I think it's important for us to think about what it is we're trying to accomplish. And someone, you talked about citizenship and valuing citizenship. And maybe one of the points is, um, the role of literacy in being able to participate in a democracy. But that's very different from the role of learning in being able to develop the atomic bomb. So many of you have talked about this, and this is just to sort of affirm what you already know. Uh, we'd like to think about each individual child's development occurring in the context of a complex web of relationships. And the reason why we've lost that model is because it's more complicated to express and understand than this one way, you know, drill them, pound the stuff into their head with flashcards or Mozart or whatever. It's not how it happens. If you think about the interpersonal interactions, we had trust, we had challenge, we had comfort, we had taking risks, we had encouragement. All of that happens in the context of a family, and it's harder for a family to offer that if they're not held by a community. So um, we are in good company. Chief Seattle, I believe, was one of the earliest system theoreticians. And what he said back about 150 years ago was basically that we're all connected to each other. And that what we do to someone else, we do to ourselves. What we do to ourselves, we do to someone else. It's a very different model of causality than the sort of brain cramming theory of how children learn and develop. And then I want to come back and give Albert Einstein another chance. Um, because he, um, I think like Chief Seattle, was also a systems theory thinker. And what systems theory says basically is that we are all members of a system that act upon each other in multiple directions. And he said it's a delusion, this sense that we have that we live inside some sort of capsule where we act alone in the world. And he says our task must be to free ourselves from this prison 
by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. And I don't mean to romanticize the village because, in fact, someone recently in New York City spent a month without electricity just to see what it would be like. And they said it, the whole thing was great, walking up 14 flights of stairs, everything, fine, except the damn washing machine. That's the one thing that I really missed. So I don't mean to romanticize the idea of village. But with the progression of technology, one of the unintended effects is that we have lost the village that raises children, and we have become more isolated. And so we may not have these um, communal places for washing. I took this picture in Guatemala about a week ago, and it reminded me of a place in France where my wife's mother used to wash clothes. But maybe this is the kind of thing that libraries are meant to step into and take the place of. Where parents get together, as someone said, to connect to each other. Now, we, someone said earlier that babies don't come with instruction manuals, and I said I would come back to that. And all over the country where people are trying out parent education classes and developing tip sheets and brochures and that kind of thing, this is what people say. You know, the trouble with parents is that they just don't know about child development because babies don't come with instruction manuals. So the solution is write them a tip sheet, that, you know, 10 pieces of advice about how to you know, raise your child to be a smart learner. You've all seen them ad nauseum. But how do you think parents really learn to become parents? What? From their kids, yeah? Learning as you go? Yeah, yeah, learning as you go, yeah. I mean, every, it's not that information is bad. Information is not bad. Advice is not bad. But it's not the whole thing. You learn from all of the things that we talked about earlier, from trial and error, from making mistakes. Kids are remarkably forgiving. I think everybody who's a parent feels that way, right? Go ahead. You learn from the parenting that you got. And some of it you want to do exactly the same way, and some of it you don't want to do that way at all. But that's your reference point, yeah. So that it, you know, written advice and tips and classes have a limited role. And in my experience, people are completely shut down to them until they're ready. I remember one lady in one parenting class, she got there and she said, you can tell me what you want to tell me, but when I get home with my kid, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. <laughs> That's what she said. And, you know, I think everybody else in that room felt exactly the same way, but she was the only one who got up there and said it. And so it's not about tip sheets and advice or classes or lectures. It's all of the things we talked about in terms of how parents learn. How do you get the guts, the courage, the comfort, the trust, the support, the encouragement to look at your mistakes in order to learn from them? Where does that come from? Well, see, I think it comes from here. You have to be connected to people who make you feel like you can fall back on them when you make a mistake and, and face it. And when we do offer tips or advice or useful information, there has to be that readiness in the relationships before, before people can take in what you do have to offer.